Look around you. Look at all the people surrounding you. Each person you come into contact with, each person who is living and breathing, they're all faced with the same question, whether they know it or not. What does my life count for? Maybe you've asked yourself the same question. If you have, then hear this. You are alive because God chose to create you. How you spend the life you've been given is what truly counts. You only have one life to live, but one life well lived can make a huge difference. This life you've been given is a rich one, full of meaning and purpose, overflowing with opportunity to change the world, all for the sake of God and His glory. You have one life, one chance to make an impact. Make it matter. Church, how we doing this morning? Good, good, good. Hey, my name is Dylan Johnson. I'm the student pastor here at Covenant Church. I think I have the best job on staff here because um, I get to uh, pastor and lead 6th through 12th grade students. And we got a large group of them right here. Can we just give a round of applause for just being here? You've come on a special day. This entire weekend is what we call Bayou Student Weekend. Bayou Student Weekend happens every year um, at our church. And um, it started Friday night and has continued, and right now is the end of Bayou Student Weekend, okay? And so these students have been here. Uh, this is our fourth session. This is your first session. Um, but good news is you don't need the first three to understand the fourth, okay? And so uh, Bayou Student Weekend is just, um, just an incredible weekend, uh, kind of the fifth year of us doing this, working on this, and the Lord's just been so good. Back in 2019, a few of us student pastors, there's five of us, um, sat down in a room and began to discuss the idea of a weekend event for students in South Louisiana, and what would it be, what would it look like if we partnered together? Student pastors, churches, partnered together, because we wanted to reach as many students as possible for Jesus. We want to see students place their faith in Jesus. We want to see students follow after Jesus. We want to see students get to know Jesus more and to make him known. And so in 2019, five of us sat down, began to think about it, pray about it. And this weekend, there were approximately 350 people in this room for Bayou Center Weekend. We had right at 90 students and about 50 um, adults that stayed through the weekend and helped us out. And so, um, and students, I love you guys. Hope you had fun uh, speaking to you guys, but also speaking to the rest of the church this morning. Uh, pray that this message is an encouraging message to you. I uh, just want to give some thanks. Uh, gave it out in the first service, but some of y'all weren't in there. Um, what, I, I just need to extend some thank yous to um, adults in this room that helped with the weekend. There's adults in this room that helped um, host homes, uh, which means that um, students went to their homes for the weekend. Some homes had up to like 13, 14 teenagers in it. Um, and so incredible, okay? Um, that, they're amazing. Um, other people um, chose to um, drive students around. And um, just an incredible thing. Some of our uh, adults, especially our, our, our adults in our student ministry that lead in the student ministry, um, did small groups and was present with the students. We had behind the scene people. We had sound guy, tech guy, I mean, everything, visuals, everything. So I just want to extend a thank you. Um, if you were part of the small groups that helped um, support students this weekend, thank you. Our goal with Bayou Student Weekend is to involve as much of our church as possible with the weekend. Students, I love you. This church loves you. And I hope just by you looking around, you see plenty of people that love you. But we asked for small groups to do. We reached out to, there was nine of them that we reached out to, and we asked them, hey, will your small group adopt one of our student groups for the weekend? And our student groups were split based off gender and grade. And so um, those nine small groups um, um, kind of accepted that with our nine student groups and prayed, students, adults, multiple adults, prayed for you by name all week, all weekend, and then that small group also helped provide food for the students at the host homes. Uh, so small groups, thank you, thank you, thank you. This morning, about 350 people woke up different than the way they came in Friday. There's students that woke up this morning with a different eternal destination 
than when they woke up yesterday morning. We saw students get saved this weekend. There's some students that woke up this morning following, running after the Lord. But yesterday morning, they were running away from the Lord. The Lord has been good this weekend. There are students that have been encouraged. Students that are trying to take their faith seriously. But church, work with students long enough, it is hard to be a teenager. And there's Christians, students that are Christians, that are trying to live out their faith in really difficult places. And this weekend, they're leaving encouraged, ready to make it matter. That was our theme for the weekend. And so I just need us to loosen up a little bit. Okay, we're all going to be students for a second. Y'all cool with that? Okay, that's what we're going to do. These two sections, when I point at you, you're going to say make. This section, when I point at you, you're going to say it. These two sections, when I point at you, you're going to say matter. Don't embarrass your section. Okay? All right. Y'all good over here? Y'all good here? Y'all good here? Okay. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Um, So, shared with you what the Lord has done um, this weekend. Um, But let me kind of give you a an idea of like schedule how things went. Friday night, we all came together Friday night for session number one with worship and message and time of response. And so incredible. So we had our first session and kind of the point with that was a life of real impact flows out of the word, the Bible working in and through our lives. And so we did that Friday night and then immediately sent students out into the parking lot and into um, the grass area for a late night block party with all sorts of inflatables and games and inflatable bounce houses, obstacle courses, inflatable slides, mechanical bull. Um, tacos were there. and Tacos make any day a good day. And so um, why not have tacos there? And so they had a fun night Friday night. They go to their host homes. They come back um, yesterday morning for session two. And we discuss, and we as in, we listened to Greg Wilton speak. Greg Wilton is the chaplain for the New Orleans Saints. And man, just challenged us session after session. And yesterday morning we talked about a life of real impact is only possible because of the work of, that Jesus did on the cross for us. And so we did that, and then after session two, it was now time for lunch, and we ate Chick-fil-A here at the church, which was amazing. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. Check this out. Check this out. The owner of Chick-fil-A was at Bayou Student Weekend. That's cool. It's cool. Um, He's a Christian. Um, Probably a good thing. And um, we asked him to pray for the Chick-fil-A food. That food was double-blessed yesterday. It was awesome. It was awesome. And so once we did that, we then sent out 300 plus people into the community and we partnered with a local ministries, businesses, nonprofits that are making it matter in the community. And so we partnered with them and made our weekend matter by helping them out so they can better make it matter with the people they're trying to reach. And then we also partnered with other needs within local churches We went and had fun and then came back for session three last night and talked about how a life of real impact is empowered through the Holy Spirit. Went home after that, and now we're here for session four. So if you got your notes, go ahead and put this down. Here is my main point for this session. Students, adults, you can make it matter when you understand who's you are. It's all about identity. What we find our identity in, we can find our identity in a whole lot of things, the things that we do, like work, fun, play. We can find our identity in people, friends, relationships, spouses, co- co-workers, all sorts of different things. We can find our identity in the good things people have said about us. We can find our identity in the bad things people have said about us. We can find our identity in life circumstances. I am who I am because of the way life has gone. Those are all realities. 
But there's got to be something deeper than that. Most of you at this point, especially your adult students, you're learning this too. There's some things we find our identity in, though, that we find out are temporary. Things that we put our identity deep in, all of a sudden, gone out of nowhere. Or you realize, what I thought was this important is actually not that important. And my identity was found in something that could have been deeper. And so right here, you, church, can make it matter when you know whose you are. Not who you are, but whose you are. Who you are in Christ. Okay, that's where I'm going. Who you are in Christ. Okay, we, we are God's. Those that place our faith in Jesus, we are in Christ. That's, that's, that's language. That's verbiage. Everybody say in. Everybody say Christ. Christ. This is language that Paul uses quite a bit in the New Testament. And the best way to understand it is if you've placed your faith in Christ, then you are in Christ. If you've placed your faith in Christ... You are in Christ. So if you have faith, which did, Jesus did on the cross, you confess him as your Lord and Savior, repent of your sins. You place your faith in Christ. If I was to ask you, hey, are you in Christ? Your answer would be yes. Yes. Okay? So here's this. I'll go ahead and open up to Ephesians 1. Go ahead and open up to Ephesians 1. Um, the book of Ephesians is so, so, so good. Uh, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians. And... Um, really popular book of his. Uh, he wrote while um, in prison, uh, had plenty of time to write different um, books or letters in the Bible. And so um, students, y'all tell me if Paul wrote it and it's two, uh, or it's, it's, the book is called Ephesians. He wrote to the churches located where? Ephesus. Ephesus. Yes. And so he wrote to some churches there. And church, this is the way Ephesians works. It's probably Paul's kind of like second most popular book. Book um, Letter number one is going to be Romans. And so if we considered Romans to be the king of his writings, Ephesians would be considered the queen of his writings. Uh, it's just incredible. And um, he's there to um, encourage the church. Christianity's really, really new. Um, Jesus has just gone back to heaven maybe 30 years ago. And so 30 years for Christianity kind of spread. That's not a long time at all. At all, And so there, there's plenty of space for um, Paul to need to teach people about God, about Jesus. Because a lot of people just, I, I just don't know. We just, it's only been around for 30 years. We need to know more. And so Paul writes Ephesians. And the way Ephesians is set up, it's six chapters. First three chapters is all about the right doctrine. Doctrine, fancy word for just things that are true about God. Theology, the study of God. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. These things are true about God. And the last three chapters, chapter 4, 5, and 6, are, hey, these are the way you should live out your life. First three, these are the right things about God, right doctrine. Last three, right way to live. So this is what I want you to understand. Students understand this. Adults understand this. Right thinking leads to right living. When I'm thinking right, I'm living right. And so that's what Paul's doing in this book of Ephesians. And what Paul immediately, I mean, from, we're starting in verse 3. I mean, it's going to go immediately. He starts to tell people right doctrine, the right things to understand so they can live out their lives correctly. And this is what I want you to understand. We're going to go through verse by verse. It's going to be a lot. I'm going to give you, a, if you see, your, if you got notes, you see there, there's stuff there. And um, I'm not going to apologize for it. Paul's the one that wrote it and puts these things. If you can imagine, um, if you were to put your face in front, in front of a fire hydrant, and we opened up that fire hydrant, that water that comes out, that's kind of how Paul's writing right here. It's boom, 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 boom. Here's what's true. Here's what's true. Here's what's true. Here's what's true. Before we read it, i got a question for you. Are you saved? If your answer is yes, why? I hope your answer to the why is because I've placed my faith in Jesus. I want you to look at this. One of the verses we looked at this weekend was Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. That's it. Not doing good things, not good outweighing bad, not attending church, not praying enough, not reading the Bible enough. You confess and you believe. You will be saved. Okay, so we got that. Are you, are you saved? Why? The next one is, what's your story? What's your testimony? When did you place your faith in Jesus? Like, like go to that moment with me. What's your conversion story? What's that day that things change? For me, I was seven years old. I was in first grade. Um, I grew up in a Christian family, went to church, and I went to a Christian school seven days out of the week. I'm hearing something about God. I had Bible class every single day in school, church on the weekend, family or Christian. I'm telling you, every day. But here's the thing. In first grade, th- things like the Bible, Jesus, those were just stories to me. They were stories just like any other book that would have been on my little seven-year-old bookshelf. Nothing different. Just another story. But there was one week in particular in first grade during Bible time that that entire week the, the, our teacher was talking about Jesus' uh, birth, life, death, and resurrection. And up on the screen, a whiteboard, on, on the whiteboard, um, there was a picture of Jesus on the cross. And I looked at that picture the entire Bible time, all five days that week. And while the teacher is teaching, and I'm looking at this picture, it no longer felt like a story like any other story I've heard before. It didn't seem just like another story that would have, I could have found in a book on my bookshelf. I'm in first grade. I'm not thinking deep or anything like that. But there was something within me that this is different. This is real. This is true. And I'm here 2,000 years later, but somehow, for some reason, in first grade, I feel like this story has something to do with me. Now, I'm not fully understanding, but I'm, I've got something to do with what my teacher is talking about this week. So there was a night that week I couldn't fall asleep. Mom and dad check on me. I'm not falling asleep. Hey, what's going on? And I began to talk with them about what I'm hearing in Bible time that week. About Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection. The teacher's talking about these things being a Christian and salvation and forgiveness and faith. And just, I, I don't know what all that means. And my mom and dad just being so gracious and good and kind, gentle, patient, walked me through the gospel and what it meant to place my faith in Christ and what was necessary to receive salvation, Romans 10, 9. When you confess with your mouth, you believe in your heart, you will be saved. So that night in first grade is when I got saved. That's my story. What's yours? And what Paul's going to talk about are truths that become true for you the moment you place your faith in Jesus. The moment, these things we're about to read, these things were true for me the moment I placed my faith in Jesus when I was seven years old. And this is what's so good. It's still true today over 20 years later. Nothing changes about what we're about to read. It became true the second I placed my faith in Jesus at seven years old. And despite the good things I've done in my life, the bad things I've done in my life, It's still just as true today as it was 20 years ago. That's true for you, too. Some students got saved this weekend. They've been saved less than 12 hours. And it's true for them 12 hours ago. It's still true for them today. Some of you have been saved for 40, 50, 60 years. And what was true for you day number one, based on what we're about to read, is still true today. And so what we're looking at in in this passage, again, I'm... We're about to do fire hose here, okay? Be, be ready. I want to look at this because I think some of these things that Paul covers and that we're going to cover this morning, there's some of us in the room with this, many people in this room, some of these are not truths about you yet because you've not placed your faith in Christ. You're not in Christ. But if you were to confess right now and believe in your heart right now, they would immediately become true about you. Now, I, I want you to know what they are. There's some of you in this room, I would have to assume 
that you're saved, but you didn't realize everything that took place the moment you place your faith in Jesus. You understand how you place my faith in Jesus? That's me. I'm seven years old. All I knew is I need, I need to place my faith in Jesus. I need to confess my Lord and Savior, repent of my sins. That's all I knew. And I got saved. What we're about to talk about, I didn't realize that when I was seven years old, but it was true about me. There's some of you, you place your faith in Jesus, but you do not realize, possibly, that the things that took place immediately at salvation are still true today. Deal, man, what you're about to read, there, there ain't no way it's still true about me. You, you don't know the, the things I've done with my life. You don't know the things I've said, the decisions, the decisions that I've made, the thoughts that I've had, how far away I've gone from God, the sins I've... Dylan, you have no idea. There's no way that what you're about to read, what Paul says, could possibly still be true about me. Church, I want to tell you something. It's still true. And then last one. What I'm about to say may be familiar to you. You're going to agree with everything I've said, but life has gotten hard or difficult, and so you've gotten distracted from some of these truths. And so I think every single one of us can get something from this message today, okay? So if you're in Ephesians, say I'm there. All right, let's double check it. When I point at you, you got to say that word? Oh, no. No. You embarrass yourself. Come on. Here we go. Okay, cool. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, here's truth number one. God tells you who you are in Christ. God tells you who you are in Christ. In Christ, you are blessed. In Christ, you are blessed. You're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed. Check it out, Ephesians 1, 3. Paul starts to write, he says, Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ Students, adults, if you place your faith in Christ, you are in Christ, you are blessed. And that started the moment you place your faith in Jesus. For me, when I was seven years old, the moment I did it, I immediately became blessed. And it has continued for 20 plus years. Let me tell you about that word, blessed. Kind of a way to understand it is um, the, the, the Greek word for it. Um, the church fathers, Catholic church, used this word, um, when, when describing some of the activities or items within the Catholic Church. If you, have, if you have any kind of background in the Catholic Church, and if you don't have a background, we're around it enough, you're going to have an idea. There are things within the Catholic Church that are blessed. You don't speak bad about certain things in the Catholic Church. Something like the Eucharist. You do not mistreat that time. Saints. like All sorts of... You know those things that are blessed in the Catholic Church. That's this word that the church fathers originally used for those things like that. And Paul's saying, you are blessed. The question is, why? Is it just because? Why? And here Paul says it in chapter 3, or sorry, in verse 3, that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens and in Christ. This is what I want you to understand. God has given us things the moment we place our faith in, in Jesus, and it continues today. Now, these things don't think earthly things, don't think physical things. Look at what that verse says. It's spiritual blessings, and where is it located? Heaven. Some things are in heaven. Some things are from heaven. And so Paul's going to start to list off some of these things. And this is what, what's so good about the Bible. And students, I want you to know this. Adults want you to know this, that God's word is sufficient. There's enough in it for us to know him. There's enough for us to understand what salvation is. There's enough for us to get a good idea of heaven. But not everything about God is in the Bible. Not everything about heaven is in the Bible. And so even this verse right here, there are some things that we're blessed because of. There's some spiritual blessings in heaven. We're going to figure out some of them here in a second. But there's some things that we've been given, that we're blessed with, that we don't even know about. Because God didn't reveal it in his word to us. We're not going to know about it until we stand face to face with him in heaven. Because it's so good, so pure, so holy, so grand, so beyond earth. We couldn't even understand it if he tried to describe it to us. We've got to be in heaven 
in order to understand it. So you are blessed because, let me give you some things that makes us blessed so that we can't understand that Paul gives us here. Number one, um, or if you keep going, Ephesians 1, 4, he says, For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless, blameless in love before him. In Christ you are chosen. I want you to know that you're chosen. God chose you. God, God wants you. God wants to be in a relationship with you. Think about this with me. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, what? God created the heavens and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1, the very beginning of the Bible. But there's something that took place before Genesis 1.1. And that's what takes place in Ephesians 1.4. For he, God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God thought about you before he created the world. He chose you. He wanted to be in a relationship with you before he even created the world. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, before we ever placed our faith in Jesus, Christ died for us. You were chosen for the foundation of the world. God, God wants to be in a relationship with you. Students, God wants to be in a relationship with you. Psalm 139, you're going to be familiar with it where he talks about like, hey, you've knit me together in my mother's womb. Like those, those verses. When you start breaking that down, we, you begin to see that God personally made you. God uniquely made you, and God purposely made you. God's chosen you. He wants to have a relationship with you. Thought about you. He wants you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. It's offered his son Jesus down the cross that we could be in relationship with him. And here's the thing. Here's the good, here, good news. Good news. It's not a, yeah, okay, like, come on, like, you, we can be in a relationship. No. He desires it deeply. Your next point is this, in Christ, another reason why we're blessed is that in Christ, you are accepted and adopted. Verse 5 and 6, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasures of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Church, students, adults. Because of what Christ has done on the cross for us, and because of our faith, the moment you place your faith in Jesus, you are accepted and adopted. When God looks at you, he doesn't see you as an enemy. He sees you as a friend. But even more than that, he sees you as an adopted son or daughter. The Bible says we're co-heirs with Christ. Not only does God want to be in a relationship with you, he wants to have a familial relationship with you. Family. God, our Father. Church, you're blessed. God's chosen you. God wants to be in a relationship with you. God offers, he, he's accepted you, he's adopted you. We're blessed because of it. Now check this out. Let's move on to verse seven. What I've told you so far are things that are true about you. You're blessed, you're chosen, you're accepted, you're adopted, and all these things are true on day one of salvation and they stay true all the way to the end because of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for how many sins? All. The moment you place your faith in Jesus, that moment for me, seven years old, every sin I committed before seven, forgiven, because my faith in Christ when he did on the cross. Every sin that I've committed since being seven and will continue to commit, forgiven because of what Christ did on the cross. These truths were true day number one, and they're still true today. And don't get in your mind, okay, they're true, but they're just a little bit less true. Like maybe God was happier to give me these things on day one. He's a little bit less happy now. Mm -mm. No. As true as it was day number one, it's true on year 20 for me. Look at this. Look at this. Let's go ahead to verse 7. Here's some things that God gives us. In Christ, you have redemption and forgiveness. I already told you that. Where Christ, because of his death on the cross, and that those that confess with their mouth and believe in their heart will be saved. We've been redeemed. God has, has, has bought us back. He's, he's paid the price. We were over here. Think like hostage situation. We want to redeem a hostage. We bring them back. Buy them back. That's what God has done for us. Man, we were over here away from him. Even me, seven years old. Away from Christ, but he redeems us because of what he did on the cross and has forgiven us. Man, church, when you stand before God, 
one day. If you're in Christ, it's open arms, absolute love, because you have been forgiven of all sins. That's what Paul's saying right here, right here, okay? So let's keep going. Let's keep going right here. Verse 8 through 10. This one, in Christ, you have all wisdom and understanding. Verse 8 says that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. Let me tell you one reason why we're blessed in this room. Because we're alive after Jesus' death. We can look back and see things. Where some people had to look well, you can't even look for it. You just, okay, there, some, something's going to happen in the future, and so we just trust in God with it. They didn't know who Jesus was. There's prophecies and stuff like that would point towards somebody, but they weren't 100% sure on who that was going to be. We live at the point where we're after his death and resurrection, so we can look back on it confidently. The Bible has been completed. We got all of Scripture. I mean, we have wisdom and understanding. Let me give you two more things. And I want to close out in prayer together. Paul continues, verse 11, In him we have also received an inheritance. Every word in your Bible is important. Look at it. Verse 11, In him we have also received. Question, have also received. Is that, is that future? No. No. This is something, we've already received this. There's an inheritance from God we've already received because we're in Christ. We're going to experience a whole lot of it one day. But this is something we've got now, an inheritance. Because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. And then here's the last thing within these verses that God has given us. Another reason why we're blessed is that in Christ You have the Holy Spirit. The moment I placed my faith in Christ at seven years old, I immediately became blessed, and all these things we've been talking about have become true, and also I received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, began to reside within me. The same is true for you as well. And this is what Paul says, in him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. God sealed it. That Holy Spirit ain't getting out of you. He's staying there. It is sealed by God. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believe, watch this, verse 14, the Holy Spirit is the down payment. It's a promise. You know what you can stand before God one day? You got a down payment. You're going to give it back one day. A down payment. The Holy Spirit is a down payment of our inheritance unto the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Students, all these things are true about you the moment you place your faith in Christ. And they're still true today. I told you at the beginning, Paul, the first three chapters are, here's all the right things about God. I just gave you some of chapter one. And starting in verse four, Things switch. There's a word in chapter 4, verse 1. It's the very first word you'll see up there, and that word is therefore. The word therefore is there for a reason. Okay? Whenever you're reading your Bible and you see the word therefore, you need to go back and read what was said before because what the, what the Bible is doing, what the, the authors that were doing this, they said something that was true. Therefore, go do something about it. And this is what Paul says. Because in Christ, what we just talked about, because in Christ we are blessed, because we are chosen, because we're accepted, because we're adopted, because we have redemption, because there's forgiveness, because we have all wisdom and understanding, because we have an inheritance, because we have the Holy Spirit, church, students, adults, therefore, I urge you to walk worthy of the calling you've received. The calling of salvation, the calling to make your life matter. Walk it out. Follow after him because of these things that are true about you. Church, the things I've told you today, don't treat this as trivia answers. If I was to ask you, hey, what does Ephesians 1 say? And you could start rattling off these things. Now, this isn't trivia 
question and answer. This is life. This is reality. Let these truths about God press in on you and encourage you that these things are true day one of salvation and they're still true today for you. And so therefore, let's walk and go out. So what I want us to do, I'm just going to take um, a few minutes to do this. Um, students, we, we want you to pray. We want you to pray. Um, we had an incredible weekend. And uh, there's some things that I'm just going to encourage you to pray for yourself. And so you'll see here on the screen, it'll say students and something to pray about. And then adults, you'll see that there, it's going to say adults and there's going to be something to pray about. And so we're just going to give us a few minutes. And I want you to pray. Students, we love you here. And so adults, pray for students based off what's up there. And students, pray for yourself based off what's up there. We're just going to take a few minutes. And then we'll close out together. I want to pray for everybody. Students, I want to pray for you that God would have, give you courage and boldness to live out your faith, to make it matter. Church, continue to pray. Continue to pray for um, friends and relationships that will encourage them and guide them. Give thanks to God during this time of prayer. Um, I want to pray, and that's want us to respond to however the Lord is leading. Students, you need to respond, and you need to place your faith in Jesus to make these things a reality. Do so, church, if these are things you need to remind yourself of, do that. If you need to take time to confess things before the Lord where you're at, do so. If you need to come up here and worship the Lord and do so. If you need to come up here and speak to the Lord, do so. If you need to come find a pastor, man, I just want y'all to know, though, that you are loved by God. And that in Christ, there are promises and good, goods available to you. And because of that, let's go out and walk in a way that's worthy of it. God, I love the people that are here. Um, God, I pray, God, that you um, bless these students. God, give them the courage and strength that they need, um, God, to continue what you started this weekend, God. Um, surround them with friends and, and adults that will support them and encourage them and keep them accountable. Thank you, God, for this weekend. God, during this, um, this time of worship here at the end, God, just help us to respond to you however is needed. God, where we make you known through our praise. God, where we go find someone we need prayer with and, and for. But God, help us to walk out this calling because of these truths that you've given us. God, we probably sing in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen, amen.